Welcome to the lecture on 6.3 for Taylor and McLaurin series. So previously we've talked about what a power series is and why they're useful. Polynomials are nice to work with and we can always use a power series to <clears throat> express a function either approximately or exactly in terms of an infinite series of monomial terms added together. So in this case, what we want to do is kind of start with something unknown. So for example, let's say f of x is just some function. We don't know the closed form for it, but we would like to write it as a power series. So then we have these coefficients c sub n that we know if we apply them in front of the powers of x then together this should converge to f of x. And let's say we center this at x equals a. So if we do that, then instead of x to the n, we really need x minus a to the n, right? So now we're centered at x equals a. So in order for this to be an appropriate power series for f of x, it has to be the case that f of x matches the power series at some point. So for example, it should be the case that it matches at the center. So right, so if this is the power series for f of x, and if I plug in a, then it should spit out f of a. So if I expand this out, I'm gonna get c naught or c sub zero, and then I get so a minus a is just zero. So then I get zero to the zero plus c1 times zero to the one plus c2 times zero squared plus et cetera and so on. And so zero to the zero being one, we just get c naught times one plus c1 times zero <clears throat> plus c2 times zero, et cetera and so on. And so everything after C naught, the, they will all vanish because they're multiplied by zero. So it's the case that C naught equals F of A, which is good because we want to determine all of the coefficients C sub N for this power series. However, there are infinitely many coefficients in the power series. So we have one down, but still infinitely many to go. So we've made some progress, but also we've made no progress. So the next thing we want to do is think about, okay, well, how can we determine what C1 and C2 and C3, et cetera, and so on are? Like, can we determine a general form for what C sub i has to be for any index i? And the way that we're going to do that is we'll just kind of observe what happens when we take derivatives. So remember that derivatives are linear operators. So what that means is that derivatives can be applied easily over sums. That's one consequence of being a linear operator. So what that means is if I take the first derivative with respect to x of f of x, right, so just applying it to both sides here, because I have summation notation, I can actually flip this derivative inside so that, is, it, that it's applied to the sum and. So now I have this 
this here. So the other thing about being a linear operator is that it plays nicely with scalar multiples. Right, so the orange comments are what I'm applying here when I flip d dx directly in front of x minus a to the n. And it's really easy for me to take the derivative of x minus a to the n with respect to x because we can just apply the power rule. So what happens here is that we get the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, c sub n, and then the power rule says that this should just be n times x minus a to the n minus 1. And so that's the first derivative of this power series. So if I simplify this further, or sorry, rather if I write out the kind of the first few terms, I'm going to get c naught times 0 times x minus a to the n uh, to the 0 minus 1 plus c1 times n times x minus a to the 0 with power. This n should be a 1, sorry. Plus c2 times 2 times x minus a to the first, etc., and so on. Then, if I plug in a, so I'll have f prime of a. So this should equal, kind of bringing everything down that I just wrote, I get c naught times 0 is 0. And so 0 times 0 to whatever power is still 0. So kind of, so this goes to 0. I'm going to get C1 times 1, which is just C1, and then I get A minus A to the 0 of power plus 2C2, A minus A to the first power plus 3C3, A minus A to the second power, and so on and so forth. And so this becomes C1 times 0 to the 0 plus 2c2 times 0 to the first power. Plus 3c3, 0 squared, plus so on and so forth. So the only term that survives is when we have 0 to the 0 power, which is 1. So this becomes c1 times 1, plus 2c2 times 0, plus 3c3. 3 times 0, et cetera. And so this will just simplify to C1. <clears throat> so, so far what we have is that F prime of A equals C1 and F of A equals C naught. So we have determined now two coefficients, which is good. We've made progress, so we still have infinitely many more coefficients. So let's try one more derivative. Let's take the second derivative and maybe from here we can develop or observe a pattern for how to derive these coefficients C sub n. So the second derivative with respect to x of f of x is applied in the following way. Right, so I'm just taking the derivative two times. And 
And so if I write out the first few terms, we get C naught times zero times negative one times X minus A to the negative two plus C one times one times zero times X minus A to the negative one plus C two times two times one times X minus A to the zero plus C three times three times two times X minus a to the first power, et cetera, and so on. So these powers will just grow from one to two to three, et cetera. And if I simplify this, C naught goes away, the whole thing goes to zero. C one, all these terms, they go to zero. And so what I'm really left with is two C two, x minus a to the zero with power plus three times two, which is six. So six C three times x minus a to the first power. And the next one would be four times three, so it'd be 12 C four x minus a squared and on and on in that fashion. So now what I want is that if I plug in A, these also still have to be equal, right? So then I would get F double prime evaluated at A should equal 2C2 A minus A to the zero with plus 6C3 X minus A to the first plus 12C4, X minus A squared. And so we can just simplify this. So F double prime of A, the only thing that survives here, oh, excuse me, you should be A. So the only thing that survives here is zero to the zero with power. All the other ones will go to zero, so I just get 2C2. So what I have is that F double prime of A over two equals C2. So now I have another coefficient, but I still have infinitely many to go. So if you're, if you're very dedicated and you like to take the time, what you could find is that in general, the nth derivative evaluated at A, when you compare it to the power series, what you would end up getting is n factorial times C sub n, right? Because every time I take the derivative, the first derivative I'm multiplying by n, then the second derivative it's n times n minus one, then the third derivative is n times n minus one times n minus two, then et cetera, and so on and so forth. So it just becomes n factorial. And so in general, we can say that nth derivative of f evaluated at a divided by n factorial is exactly the coefficient c sub n. Therefore, f of x has the power series summation n equals zero to infinity of c sub n, which is the nth derivative of f evaluated at a over n factorial times x minus a to the nth power. So again, this is a power series for f of x centered at x equals a.
And so here we just see that in the definition. We also have theorem 6.6, 6, which says that if F has a power series at A that converges to F on some open interval containing A, then that power series is the Taylor series for F at A. So it's just kind of the uniqueness theorem saying that like, we really don't have to worry about there being an alternative to that. We can use this and kind of let our minds relax that we're not going to discover something else that may contradict us later. In general, Taylor series are used to approximate functions with a polynomial. So when we have the infinite series, the Taylor series, that Taylor series converges to the actual function itself. But when we're going to approximate a function with a Taylor polynomial, the difference between saying Taylor polynomial and Taylor series is a polynomial has finitely many terms and a Taylor series has infinitely many terms. And again, none of us have time to add up an infinite amount of monomials together evaluated at the nth derivative, centered at some point, yada, yada, yada. So usually what we'll do is we'll say, hey, I wanna approximate this function or approximate the, you know, this function at a point within some sort of tolerance. Maybe the error is one over a thousand. How many terms do I need to go out to in order to do that? So we'll kind of practice doing a Taylor approximation with a Taylor polynomial that'll give us an idea of, you know, within range what the function should be. So in example 611, they want us to find P0, P1, P2, P3. Blah. Let's just find P3. If you can find P3, you've already found P0, P1, and P2. So to identify, so we're not gonna do these. So f of x, <clears throat> just to rewrite it in a highlighted form, and then is ln of x. And then here we also have that a equals one. So remember that what we're given is f of x equals ln of x. So we could also use a power series where we evaluate the derivative at its center. Right, but again, I don't wanna add up infinitely many terms, so I just wanna approximate this. So the idea is that the Taylor polynomial of degree three is just the partial sum from n equals zero to three of the very same form. So again, I'm not going to add up all the terms, I'm just going to stop at third degree. So if I wanna use the third degree Taylor polynomial to approximate f of x equals ln of x, then I need to know centered at x equals zero, <clears throat> sorry, centered at x equals one, I need to know f of one, the first derivative at one, the second derivative at one, and the third derivative at one. So usually what I do when I set up these problems is I kind of make a list of derivatives And then after I do that, I do the derivatives at the center. So for us, our center is one. So the zeroth derivative is just the function itself, which was ln of x. And if I plug in one for ln of x, I just get ln of one, which equals zero. Then the first derivative, is one over x. So then one over one equals one. So again, just plugging in one of whatever derivative I find. Then the second derivative of x 
is negative 1 over x squared. So negative 1 over 1 squared is negative 1. And then the third derivative is the last one I need because this is a third degree Taylor approximation. <clears throat> so I get 2 over x cubed. So this is going to be 2 over 1 cubed, which is 2. So now that I have these, I can go ahead and set up my Taylor polynomial. So again, P3 of x is the partial sum from n equals in zero to three of the nth derivative of f evaluated at the center, which is one divided by n factorial times x minus the center, which was one to the nth power. So if I write this out, I get And we already know what these derivatives are. So the zeroth derivative evaluated at one was zero. So zero over zero factorial, x minus one is zero. F prime of one was one, so one over one factorial, x minus one to the first. The second derivative was negative one. And the third derivative was 2. So if we simplify, this is 0, this is 1, negative 1 half, this becomes 1 third. Okay. So I get x minus 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 squared plus 1 third x minus 1 cubed. So this is the third degree Taylor polynomial approximation for the function f of x equals natural log of x. Fun fact in general, the nth derivative of f at x over n factorial, well, and just in general, how about just start with the nth derivative at x? <clears throat> Let's think about what that should be. So I'm kind of just doing one little extra. So let's do the fourth derivative. So this would be negative six over x to the fourth. So where does this negative six come from? It's negative three times negative two times negative one, right? So I'm always multiplying these successive terms together. So it's really, n minus one factorial, negative one to some power times n minus one factorial. So how does this alternate, right? Like I need an exponent on my negative one. So let's go back up and look. On the fourth derivative, it's negative. On the third derivative, it's positive. On the second derivative, it's negative. So if n is even, I need this to be negative, so I'll just do this, and plus one. Then not using the Taylor polynomial, actually using the Taylor series,
which we know has the form f to the n evaluated at 1 over n factorial times x minus 1 to the n, then what happens is at 1, the numerator is always going to be 1. So it's just this factorial thing, right? So what we would get is negative 1 to the n plus 1 times n minus 1 factorial, right? So that's f prime of n evaluated at 1. That still goes over n factorial. And then I have x minus 1 to the n. So just in general, we could simplify this to The coefficients look a lot like the alternating harmonic. But we still have this x minus 1 business. But I know that 1 raised to any power is just going to be 1. So it's not going to throw up those coefficients. Therefore, if I plug in 2, check this out. So ln of 2. So 2 minus 1 becomes 1. So this just simplifies to oops, sorry. So now I know that if I wanted to actually compute a value for alternating harmonic series, it's going to be some variation of ln of 2. Right, so now we've seen kind of the usefulness of power series. In before in chapter 5, we weren't really concerned about what something converges to unless it was geometric. Um, in general, we were kind of just like, does it converge? If it does, is it conditional or absolute? And if it doesn't, you know, where would it diverge? What are the intervals of convergence, et cetera? But now here, using this power series, we're saying, hey, not only does this thing converge, this is the value to which it does converge. I think that's really powerful. So hopefully you can maybe find a spark of appreciation for power series in this moment. All right, so next we want to talk about McMoran polynomials. And even though they have a totally different name, it's really simple. McLaurin is just a special name we give when a Taylor polynomial or a Taylor series is centered at x equals 0. So again, I'm not going to do p0, p1, p2 separately. I'm just going to kind of cut straight to p3. So we're still going to do a third degree McLaurin polynomial approximation for f. Um, I'm just going to do a and b. c, I will leave to you guys. So in general, we want to find a way to kind of nicely write the McLaurin polynomial. Again, just a Taylor polynomial centered at zero. So it's going to have the exact same form. So instead of writing minus zero, I can just simplify this. And I want to say what this looks like. I want to give an approximation for P3. 
So T3 of X is just going to be the partial sum from N equals zero to three of the nth derivative of F evaluated at zero over N factorial by X to the N. So I need to compute my derivatives up to the third derivative. And then I need to evaluate those derivatives at X equals zero. So derivatives? No, I don't think so. Derivatives. So the zeroth derivative is just the function itself, which is e to the x. Then the first derivative is also e to the x, which is why this is everyone's favorite function. Second derivative, e to the x. Third derivative, still e to the x. So when x equals zero, these are all going to be one. One, 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 one. So P3 equals the zeroth derivative, which is one, over zero factorial times x to the zero. Plus the first derivative at one, or at zero, which is one, over one factorial, and so on. And I think it's really easy here to see a pattern. So this is the third degree McLaurin polynomial approximation for f of x, where f of x equals e to the x. Check, done. In general, the nth derivative of f evaluated at zero is just one. So if I wanted to write Kind of a simplified version for our power series for this function, it would just be one over n factorial times x to the n, or rather x to the n over n factorial. So now here's something very interesting. If I plug in one, then this is just e, right? e to the first power is just e. And it equals the sum of one to the n, which is again, just one over n factorial. So not only are we saying that one over n factorial is a convergent series, I'm also able to now say that the value or this series converges to the value e. So this is pretty fun because both the natural log of 2 and e are transcendental numbers. So these sums are taking on these interesting qualities. So now let's go to example b, which was f of x equals sine of x. Right. And so we know that this has a power series associated to it, and it also has the form that we've been seeing. Again, we're centered at zero, so I don't have to worry about writing x minus a. So for us, I just need to compute the derivative. So we want to find p3. So zeroth derivative being just the function itself, which is just sine of x, sine of zero is zero. The first derivative is cosine of x, cosine of zero is one. Second derivative 
is negative sine of x, and so this is just zero again. And then the third derivative is cosine of x, negative cosine of x, so this is just negative one. And we would actually end up getting zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, et cetera, and so on forever. So if I want to write P3, I get zero over zero factorial times x to the zero, plus one over one factorial x to the one, plus zero over two factorial x squared, plus negative one over three factorial x cubed. And so this just simplifies to x minus one over three factorial x cubed. Or you could write one sixth if you like. If you wanted to write the general form, this is just fun, something you can work out on your own. I don't think I'm gonna belabor it too much. Um, if you noticed a pattern in the derivatives, what you would get here is only the odd powers survive. And so you can write <clears throat> the sine of x in this way. So in the next video, we're gonna start on Taylor's theorem for the remainder, and then using Taylor series to approximate functions at a certain point.